December 2nd, 1993, Medellin, Colombia. Infamous drug lord Pablo Escobar is shot in the head after a brawl between his bodyguard and the oncoming police forces of the United States and Colombia. People are out on the streets, either celebrating or rioting against the government. Others are sulking inside their home and facing the haunting real realization of the following hardships. Pablo Escobar took a stand in history against the strength and power of American and Colombian national forces to protect the people who are less than him. In Rio Negro, Colombia, December 1st, 1949, Pablo Emilio Escobar Grabira was born to Abel de Jesus and Hamilda Grabiria. Even though he was the third oldest of his family of five, he was very short in stature. So the nickname he was given was Pablito, meaning Little Pablo, and the name stuck. His mom was an elementary school teacher at a local school, and his dad was a farmer of assorted vegetables, and his family had a better financial situation than some of their countrymen. Even though his family was not quite impoverished, his father suffered from alcoholism and drug addiction problems that hurt his family so much that young Pablito and his brothers and sisters could rarely see either of their parents because of how tirelessly Hamildo had to work and how often their father, Abel, was out late spending his money drinking or gambling. Despite Pablo Escobar's terrible and frightening start to life with his family, he always had ambitions to write his name in the history books of the world. He would go around school proclaiming to his friends, or anybody that would listen, about how he would become the next revolutionary president of Colombia, and that someday, everyone in the world would remember his name. Unfortunately, Pablo was convinced that the only way he could attain such fame and glory would be in criminal duties. His first offenses as a petty theft came when he was 13 years old. He would steal gravestones from the local cemetery and then give them to local dealers so they could illegally resell them to make a profit. Even though they paid Escobar a mere five pesos, little Pablito was exhilarated by the feeling of money and he was thirsty for more. After that, Escobar and Oscar Bernal Aguirre, his friend and partner in crime, began stealing and reselling vehicles off the street, selling fake lottery tickets, and committing petty street crimes. They eventually forced the Medellin officials to pay them $100,000 for the ransom of a Medellin representative. But by far, the duo's most infamous job has to be the Marlboro Awards of Colombia. Colombia had outlawed the use and import of specific brands of cigarettes to attempt at bringing in more native ways of buying. Despite the new restricting law, many drug dealers illegally brought in the outlawed brands, most famously the mass amounts of illegal Marlboro cigarettes. Pablo Escobar and Oscar Bernal Aguirre were the most efficient in these times and made a formidable profit. Escobar and Aguirre both became millionaires at the young age of 22. After his early success at smuggling, Pablo decided to go into the dealing business. He formed the Medellin Cartel in 1975, and it was founded along with Jorge Luis Ochoa Vasquez, Griselda Blanco, George Hung, and Carlos Leher Jose Gonzalo Rodriguez Gacha. The Medellin cartel was so efficient due to its geographic advantages over other dealing countries, making it a target for drug consumers around the world. The cartel mainly did business with Bolivia, Honduras, U.S., and Colombia, and made up over 80% of the entire world's drug dealing business. With their assets, the Medellin cartel exported 60 to 80 tons of cocaine and made about $420 million per month. To really appreciate how much money that really is, that's about 1.26 billion pieces of Colombian currency per month. They also spent $2,500 on rubber bands just to hold the stacks of money. Pablo, surprisingly, didn't spend all of his share of the profit. He instead decided to provide luxuries to the impoverished communities of Colombia. He built soccer fields, gave away money, helped out the poor, and overall helped out anyone who was in poverty. He always tried to give these people that he loved the childhood that he never got to experience. In 1988, the Medellin cartel was still pumping out narcotics to other countries, and the U.S. was starting to catch on. They released their SWAT forces out onto Colombian soil, and then convinced the Colombian national government to listen to their wealthier citizens, and start a pursuit of Pablo Escobar and his cartel. And in 1981, it commenced. Pablito was chased all over the country, 
and he declined to stay in houses that could have hindered him for a while. But he declined because he loved the people, and he knew he would put them in danger. In 1990, while Escobar was standing up to Colombia and America, he decided to buy out the general manager spot on the Colombian national soccer team. The poorer citizens of Colombia loved the idea of having Pablito as a manager of the national team, but the middle and upper class citizens were skeptical from the beginning. There were no outbursts of anger from these people, but most boycotted the games in protest. Despite the controversial Escobar takeover, the team performed beautifully. They were winning games by huge score lines and won over fans with their seamlessly effortless skills. At the heart of it all was young defender Andres Escobar. Despite sharing the same surname, Andres and Pablo were in no way related to one another. Andres could do it all. He could slide, score, tackle, anything he wanted. Along with Andres, the team impressed so much that Brazilian soccer legend Pele told the press that his pick to win the World Cup was Colombia. Colombia stormed past qualifiers, coming in first place. Eventually, the World Cup was dawning upon them, and there was a bonus too. Since the 1990 World Cup would be held in America, Pablo Escobar could come out of hiding and join the team since the United States would have to focus on funding and building a World Cup. Ironically enough, Colombia got drawn in the same playing group as the USA soccer team. There was just one problem with the upcoming World Cup. Rene Higueta, the Colombian national team goalie, and a few other players had just been arrested on the charges of drug smuggling with Pablo's Medellin cartel. This not only weakened the Colombian side, but it scared the players. Some of the players quit the side because of the affiliation with Pablo Escobar, while others were scared to quit because of what Pablo would do to them. The national team's first game was against Switzerland, and they won, but with a narrow 1-0 escape. The pressure was building on Pablo, and the players were starting to get death threats if they didn't win the group. Their next game held a lot of pressure. They were going up against a good Romanian side. The threats got to the players as they lost 3-0. The last game held all of the points, and it was against a struggling American team. The Colombians believed that even with their families being threatened if they didn't at least qualify, they lost an early goal, but all of the eyes seemed to be on Pablo Escobar and how he would manage the situation. The rivalry between the two struggling teams was now unreal, with Pablo Escobar seeming to finally stand up face to face with his rival. Colombia was struggling, and the threats were pounding in everyone's mind. They had to get a goal, or they would be out of the tournament. The Americans were coming down the left-hand side, and the American John Hark crossed the ball into the box, and time seemed to stand still. At least for Andres Escobar, it did. He had scored an own goal and knocked his own country out of the World Cup. The players came home quickly and all of their families had remained safe. Pablo had gone straight into a hiding to get a head start against the United States forces. Andres, however, had decided to go drinking that night to try and wash away the guilt he was feeling. At the bar, Andres ran into a well-known gang leader, Humberto Castro Munoz. Apparently, Munoz had heavy bets on the game and blamed Andres for his loss. Munoz took out his pistol and before Andres could react, Munoz had shot him. He continued shooting nine times, shouting goal every time he shot. Pablo Escobar had heard about the death of Andres Escobar and, even though they had no relation, he was distraught. A few weeks after the tragic murder of Andres Escobar, the famed, loved, and caring drug lord Pablo Escobar had surrendered to the Colombian police forces for preferential treatment and a no-death sentence. After two long years of negotiation, Pablo had told them that he would be at the top of a rooftop for them to come and bring him to his lifelong prison sentence. Yet the Colombian police force went back on their word with Pablo and informed the United States of his whereabouts. On December 2, 1993, the U.S. SWAT force stormed Pablo from the rooftops, and after a gun battle with Pablo's bodyguard, Pablo Escobar was killed by an unnamed soldier. Even though most were raised to hate Pablo Escobar and see him as an evil man, the people of Colombia were outraged when the news reports came in. He had done so much and defied the largest military forces in the world for his people, and they needed to repay him. They carried his dead body in a casket made up of recycled objects and treated him as if he were a god. Pablo Escobar took a stand in history by defying American and Colombian forces so that he could keep the people he had cared for safe. He is amazingly misrepresented in the world image today, and this is why we need to see the other side of Pablo Escobar.